HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world, join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got to cover. And now on with the show. My guest today is Eleanor Hagland. Eleanor is the founder and CEO of Alliance, a network of entrepreneurs that provides peer-to-peer community groups to help accelerate their learning while they're growing their own business. Alliance has also been featured in Forbes, Ambitious Entrepreneur, among other publications. Eleanor was an inaugural member of the Innovation Scholars Program in Project Olympus and won awards in several startup competitions like the the Columbia Venture Challenge and Hack a Startup. Thanks so much for joining me today, Eleanor. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you here. Uh, We're going to be talking about Uh, how a business can stand out and be attractive to investors and things. So actually, my first question is, I'm curious what you think makes a company stand out? I feel like, I mean, that's such a great question. And it it's a great question because it's it's incredibly individual to the investor and to the type of person looking for that particular company. Um, But I think that in in my personal experience and, and in some of the cases that I've seen, Something that makes um, startups stand out is um, is grit, it's determination, and it's that hard work that goes along with just kind of being willing to to never ne- to never give up on kind of what you're what you're working on, um, as well as a willingness to be humble with that with that determination and that belief that you can make a, a difference with in the world, and actually listen to feedback and and learn from your experience and not just say, oh, that that failure or that didn't work. um, And I'm just gonna keep doing the same thing and hope that it's different next time. Yeah, yeah. So um, being able to be uh, accept input and feedback, I guess would would also, yeah, be really valuable. Excellent, okay. So what are the like the main factors that a business should be aware of so they can be attractive to investors? Yeah, so one of the biggest things that um, that people talk about when they're talking about uh, investing in different companies is is team. Um, and some entrepreneurs are maybe a little bit tired of hearing about um, about team. Um, but making sure that you have kind of the right people around you, the right people for the industry, the right people for the problem, that's really important in, in catching the eye of, uh, of the right investors. Um, and then on top of that, um, th- there's traction, which is a, a fun word for what, what have you done with what, what you have? And first for folks that have already raised funds, it's, it's how you use those funds to really 
multiply the effect of, of the dollars into success for the company. But for people who haven't yet raised money, it's you didn't have money. So what did you do? How were you creative? How did you, who did you reach out to proactively? Um, how, did you talk to your customers? Have you gotten your customers to commit uh, to, to pay for some product in the future? Any, any piece where you can show that you understand your market, that you're solving a real problem, um, and that you don't necessarily, that you're not necessarily waiting for someone to hand you a check for, for you to make progress means a lot in the eyes of the investor. Right. I'm so glad that you said that because what pops into my mind is someone who seeks funding but hasn't done really any of the work, hasn't put any of their own, you know, sweat or money or, you know, anything into it and is expecting, but thinks it's a great idea mm -hmm. and is expecting someone else to put money into it. Yeah. And I, and I think that most investors are able to tell, you know, like they're able to see which people are in it because they care deeply about the problem and that they're willing to put in the work. And, they, and then they can see also who's in it because they want to be the next billionaire um, and, and do maybe not as much work as someone who's really committed to, to the problem or the cause. Yeah, exactly. Right. So are, are there suggestions that you have or, or maybe um, best practices for how someone can prove to an investor that the product really has a good market fit? Yeah, I mean, so one of the one of the best suggestions I ever got from a mentor as I was building one of my last um, companies was you don't need the product and you don't need um, and you don't need money. So just go out there and talk to your customers, do a ton of customer interviews. And once you think that you've kind of got the right idea or solution for the problem, figure out what the, and this is, this word has become used for lots of different things uh, these days, but find your minimum viable product. And that does not need to be a software tool. It doesn't need to be even like an image or like a a piece of paper. It just needs to be providing the service that you or providing the product, the solution um, that you think will solve the problem. And if it's a software product, um, maybe it's you in a black box on the phone providing something similar. Um, or for example, like if you wanted to do a minimum viable product of Airbnb, you would not even like necessarily put um, put an ad on Craigslist, you would just be you texting a friend, selling a space in a home with maybe a picture. And that's a minimum viable product version of Airbnb. So come up with that once you feel like you have um, the fit and just start selling that. Get as many people to commit to pay or even better yet pay you for this really, really dumbed down version of your product. And that, that traction will prove to the investor that there is a willingness to pay because people are willing to pay you um, and that you're willing to pound the pavement and, and sell um, your product because at the end of the day, you're the, you're the most invested in it. That is such a great example. Thank you. Uh, yeah. That, that, yeah, that just makes perfect sense to me. Totally. Wow. Okay. Business leaders, um, need to build trust, you know, and mm -hmm. then there's the credibility thing and authority and uh, in their industry, you know, which leads to trust. Um, so <laughs> what methods do you think are good for business leaders? You know, what things should they do in order to build that level of trust and credibility? Do you have any? Oh, yeah. Ideas? I, I, I really love that question because I, I try to incorporate some of that authenticity into kind of everything, everything that I do. And I think that that's, that is one of the keys to building trust with people is to be authentic, is to not pretend to be someone you're not, to just meet people and talk to them as people, get to know them. Don't, 
Don't reach out to them just for the sake of getting them to do something or to invest in your company, but truly like to build relationships um, with people that you're interested in getting to know. And as a natural product of that, you will be connected with people that you need to be connected to, and they will be willing and able to help you um, to the best of their ability. Um, but the, I think the key component of that is that it takes time. Um, <laughs> Like no, no relationship, um, no, no real authentic relationship was built in a day. Um, and so you can, you can meet people and you have to keep in touch with them. You have to let them know what you're up to. You have to ask them how they're doing and what they're up to. And if you can help with anything, um, and as they, as you connect with them at, at different touch points and, and at different times, they'll have seen you, they'll have seen your progress. They'll believe that you're capable of delivering on the things that you that you said you were capable of delivering. And now they have proof along with the fact that they can trust what you say. Um, and I mean, one of, the, one of the best examples of this is, um, is basically like startup update emails, like startup um, update emails get sent out maybe once a month, maybe once a quarter and my favorite story is an investor that I had. Um, we'd been sending out this update email. And after a couple of quarters, I got an email that said, we're interested in investing in, in your company. And that was because over time, they had seen that we had delivered what we had promised to deliver and no more and no less. And that was, that was exactly what they were looking for. And you weren't pitching them? No, we weren't pitching them. Um, at, at the time, we weren't even raising. Yeah, that's great. That, that, that is great. Um, and I totally agree with you. I think people try to fast track that process mm -hmm. because they, they have a goal in mind. Sure. And they're so focused on the goal that they're not even thinking about that people have to really get to know each other. You know, I always say it's like dating, mm -hmm. right? You don't get married on the first date. You did. <laughs> True. You know, so... It, it's you have to build that level of um, connection and trust in mm -hmm. order to then want to do business with someone. Yeah, especially I mean now the world is is even more digital than it was before. Some yeah. some people you're not even meeting in person. You've only ever seen them on a screen. Right. And so and you, you you've never been in the same room. So how do you know that you can trust them? You just you takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's so funny. I was just talking to a guy yesterday who said. He was working on, he got a referral to a company. He was working on, um, you know, getting to know what they needed, providing him it, with a proposal and he couldn't really get it moving. And mm -hmm. then he said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to fly out. Yeah. And he flew out and he spent a couple days with them and closed the deal. Yeah. That's exactly right. It. Just mm -hmm. being able to be there, be himself, mm -hmm. you know push, you know, just really show that he is the real deal and he's a good guy and, and all those things. Yeah. 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 That, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, no doubt. This episode is brought to you by Klaviyo, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Klaviyo, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O.com slash Spotify. The world's best known investor and Wall Street expert, Warren Buffett, once said, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. Mr. Buffett's quote is remarkably accurate, but how many people would rather receive advice from him than someone simply guessing? Welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell, your single source for Wall Street knowledge and profitable guidance. Please join me, Todd Schoenberger, and fellow trader Tobin Smith, as well as host Veronica Dudo, for a podcast known to move the needle for investors. Tobin and I are seasoned Wall Street executives with deep investment experience, and we are prepared to share our advice to those who choose to listen. Download Buy, Hold, Sell today on the Evergreen Podcast Network or your favorite podcast channel. So there's progress mm -hmm. and there's um, credibility. Mm -hmm. Are there other things that like make 
a story exciting to an, to an investor? I think that it, the answer is actually in the question that you ask is, mm -hmm. are you, are you telling a story is ah. a question that I ask entrepreneurs all the time. It's kind of like, you've shown me a lot of slides <laughs> <laughs> and I, I believe in your problem. I believe in your solution. I believe in your team. But if I didn't, if I didn't already know your problem, if I didn't already know your solution, I would have stopped listening to you on slide two. Wow. Um, and so the, and the key to kind of overcoming that and really getting people to listen to you is this telling of a story of, of bringing the listener in and knowing who you're talking to, um, knowing what their background is, knowing what they already know, and then weaving, weaving them or their experience or, um, or just telling the story properly to your audience um, makes a huge difference um, than your kind of standard, this is the problem, this is the solution, this is what we've done kind of pitch. That's really interesting. So that feels to me like there's the possibility you're gonna to have to have a different story depending on which audience you're in front of. Sometimes, I mean, so, and that's not to say that you need to be like, pandering to your audience like your your story your core your values what your mission is that all needs to stay consistent um but how you're telling it could be very different based on whether you're talking to an expert someone in the industry or someone's like friend of a friend who's just kind of interested in you and heard you were smart um and those pitches are all very very different yeah that makes sense yeah. Are there things that a business should avoid doing that might be a deal breaker with an investor? <laughs> I would say um, never lie. <laughs> um, and a and that rule of thumb. is a good rule of thumb. And it, but it comes in, in play a couple of times, especially as startups are expected to go to, to do so much with so little um, that the like the, the, I've seen the pull of kind of wanting to overinflate what they've done. Um, and that's, that's an immediate eroder of trust. Um, so that's one thing to never do. Um, and then also probably never to like make promises that you don't think you can keep. So if you're, if you're in a pitch and you tell an investor um, by Q2 of next year, we're going to be making half a million dollars in revenue um, and the investor says, okay, great. I'm really excited about your company, about your product. Um, we're not ready to invest, but in six months, when you've reached that revenue milestone, we'll be your first investor, no problem. You then have to deliver on a million dollars in Q2 of next year. And so if you, to, to be reasonable with what you're projecting, because if you can say, for sure, we're gonna get to half a million dollars in, in six months, and you do that, that person is genuinely going to write you a check. Um, but if you don't, uh, you're probably never going to get money from them or probably anyone, anyone they know because the, the networks are very small. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And it actually leads me to another question about are, are there the common mistakes that you see founders make when they start a business? Yeah. What kinds of things are those and, and how would you suggest they avoid doing those things when they're starting up? Yeah, I would say that I see the, the most common mistake at the very beginning of the, of the startup journey is either um, building a product and then going to talk to customers um, or just not really even bringing the product to customers in the first place, like, like not talking to them about it or, or learning how they're using existing tools or existing, um, existing solutions. Um, because you end up wasting a lot of time. It, like, it doesn't matter how, how smart you are or how well you personally know the industry. Um, if you're not engaging with the people who actually have the problem right now, you're gonna miss something. Um, and it's that, and that would have saved you time and saved you money if you had just kind of talked to folks. Um, so one of the easy ways to fix that is to just 
first of all, go out and find 50 customers, 100 customers, however many you're willing to, to talk to and reach out to, and just listen to them. Like actually ask them questions that don't lead them to the answer that you want them to give you. Um, and, and listen to their answers and incorporate that, that feedback. If it's good, you're, you're obviously the arbiter, but um, into, into your product or to even go to pitch competitions and pitch your idea and then hear what questions people are asking. Because more often than not, folks are gonna be asking the same questions over and over again. And there's gonna be something that's obvious to other people that's not obvious to you because you're in it. And finding out what you don't know is going to save you so much time and so much money. Yeah, that's great advice. Mm -hmm. I like that idea of going to pitch competitions because, yeah. you know, then you have an audience of people mm -hmm. and, and you can see what consistently comes up. Yeah. And you get supporters too. I mean, you're pitching your idea and more often than not, there's somebody in the audience that's like, oh my God, that is my problem. Or I would love to use this. And I have these other 10 people who would love to use this. Or I run a company that does something that would help you guys. It, you just meet so many people through the process. Right, exactly. Do you find that um, people come up with ideas that they think are needed, but uh, the, no one else does? <laughs> <laughs> I think that everyone who's ever come up with an idea came up it came up with it because they thought it was needed and so that's that's a, that's kind of a must like they they had seen certain things it's experienced certain things that indicated to them that it was a problem and so on some level it probably is like most most people are going to to take the culmination of their experience and come to a conclusion and there's probably something there um but the question and i think what like the heart of your question is like does that mean that it's a good business does that mean right. that 10 50 100 a 1, thousand a million people are going to have as the same problem because that is what what is required to have a, a like a sustaining business. Um, and I would say that more often than not, they've come up with a problem and they've come up with a solution, but it's not probably a big enough problem. And that that's even made more like obvious or more acute when you think about like investors and VCs, because what you need, like the big, the, the market size that you need to get to like, a self-sustaining business is much smaller than the market size and the revenue numbers you need to get a VC interested because they need three to 10 X their investment. Um, oh. and, and that makes a big difference um, when they're looking at you. It's, you might have a great business and, but, but for a VC, for it to be worth their while. Yeah they need it to be a much bigger market. That's so interesting. Yeah. Will you explain, uh, and, and you know, you know, I guess uh, Cliff Notes version, what the yeah. difference is between like a VC, an angel investor, sure. SBA? Yeah. Well, so um, the, the main folks that invest in startups are angels. Um, sometimes they come together in angel syndicates and then VCs. So um, angels are individual high net worth um, people who usually invest based on their own personal experience or in industries that they, that they know um, and can pro provide some kind of additional like expertise to help the founder. Um, they're usually earlier um, on in the, in the life cycle and they usually write smaller checks. Although they, some of them are very high net worth individuals and can rival some, certainly some of the smaller VCs. Um, an angel syndicate is just a, like a conglomerate of angels that come together and um, invest together. So their smaller check sizes become larger check sizes um, when they invest together. And then VCs are the or organizations in which investors have taken on outside money from extremely high net worth individuals or just high net worth individuals. And um, they invest on behalf of those people. 
Um, and their goal is to make enough money that they as a VC can survive and continue um, and that they can also return um, an enormous amount of money to their, um, to their stakeholders. Interesting. And, and do they, you, you said something about the angel that got me wondering about, is there a level to which they get involved in the management of the company or is that negotiable or, you know, what does yeah. that look like? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it depends on the investor and how, how much they want to be involved. And then also on the startup and how much they want their investors to be involved. Um, I would say that all of the good investors will be involved as much as you'd like them to, or as little as you'd like them to. Um, but they usually provide really good connections. Um, some of them have exceptional industry expertise um, and can help you with different business development opportunities. Um, and some of them just can like help you hire or just give you some, some advice on the, on the good days and the bad days. Um, just kind of are there as, as a sounding board because they've, they've been there before. Um, so it, it really does depend. That's great. That's great. But th this is so interesting. And I, I feel like this is one of those areas that the vast majority of people know nothing about. So they develop ideas in their head about what <laughs> is actually going on you know, yeah. and how they can play. And then, you know, they're sort of surprised when that doesn't happen. Um, so is there anything that, that else that you think the listeners should know, um, especially if they're, if they have an idea in mind mm -hmm. and are thinking about doing something with it. I would say that if, if they have an idea and they're thinking about doing something with it, the, to take the first steps, um, definitely on their own, like find, find who you think your customer is and, and talk to them and talk to them as much as you can, as you can handle and stand and how much time you have, uh, like fill it all with your, with your customers. And then I would say in parallel, find people that you trust and that you're willing to work with long-term. Um, and hopefully, you know, you know, some people already that you, that you trust because it takes some time, as we mentioned, to, to build those relationships. Um, and, and bring them in and, and give them ownership and, and make the team have all of the different aspects that you need to kind of tackle the market and bring them in at like the earliest stage because they're gonna be the most bought in when, they, when they've been part of the story the whole time. Um, so I, I, those are the two things that I would recommend. If you, if you have an idea and you wanna go for it, talk to your customers and build your team from, from day one. So I love that advice. Thank you. And what do you say to someone who says, I don't really want to talk to anybody about it until it's a thing because I'm afraid someone will steal it? Yeah, that's that's another good one. Um, if someone can steal it, it's either not innovative enough or mm -hmm. you're telling them too much about it. So okay. if you if you have something that you think is patentable or protectable, um, like definitely file a provisional to, to protect it if you're, if you're concerned. Um, but then it, in almost every case, especially in the early stages, no investor is going to be willing to sign an NDA with you before they know what you're doing. They talk to too many people, they'd be signing NDAs all day, every day. And then they wouldn't be able to talk about anything to anyone. <laughs> Um, so the best way to do it is to figure out what you can share without revealing your, your secret sauce to, to figure out what value you're providing and maybe some explanation of how you're doing it without letting someone copy you, um, without showing them the schematics, uh, per se. Right, 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 right. Got it. Okay, good. Wow. I Eleanor, I so appreciate this conversation. This, you know, as I said a minute ago, this is something people really don't understand, but there's so many people who have ideas and then really don't know what to do with them that I'm, I'm grateful that you came on here and shared some of that information with us. So now they have a 
better idea of what they can do, but would you also share with them how they can find you and um, a little bit about what Alliance is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, Alliance is the culmination of many years of working in, in the startup world. And it's basically a platform that helps startups get connected to the right investors and vice versa. Um, so startups go on, they answer some questions, um, and then we are able to, to match them to the right folks on the other side. And the investors also input their thesis. And so we know what they're looking for um, when we're, when we're um, matching them with the startups. Um, you can find us online at www.alliancewithans.com. Um, and there, and everyone is also free, feel free to email me at Eleanor at Alliance.com or to find me on LinkedIn, uh, Eleanor Hagland. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really very valuable. And I, and I love that Alliance. I think, you know, what a, what a great service to provide to uh, people with ideas. So again, thank you for thank joining you. us. Thank and you for having me. You bet. And listeners, thank you. You're who we're doing this for. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not, it's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily.